Now, I want to be preaching on this morning here. You see that this whole chapter is dedicated, in 2 Peter chapter 2, is dedicated to false prophets. And the title of my sermon this morning is Beware False Prophets. Because there's a lot of false prophets out there today, um, as there always has been. There's always been false prophets in the world. And you can see here in, in verse number 1 of 2 Peter 2 where we started reading, it says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily, that means like privately or secretly, shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. So he says here, look, even as there shall be false teachers among you, there's going to be false teachers among you. There's false teachers among us today. And what they do is they try to be real sneaky about it. They privately, they, they, they bring in damnable heresies. They're going to try to, to um, convince you of heresy and, and lies that are not of the Bible. Now, the Bi we're going to talk about this tonight, but these people are reprobates. They're, they're, they're God-hating. They have an agenda. They, these false prophets have a specific agenda to just to try to destroy God's word. Look at verse number two. It says, and many shall follow their pernicious ways. A lot of people are going to be sucked into this stuff. They're great deceivers. They try to, they, they basically what they do is they take the truth and they mix in some lies and just make the whole thing a lie. But they get a lot of people to follow them. The second half of that verse says, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. So because of these people, because of these false prophets, they're going to cause the real truth, the real way of truth, to be evil spoken of. And I can't think of a better example than you hear about these, these priests or these pastors who are involved in some extremely wicked sins, like these pedophiles that are behind a pulpit, yeah. supposedly, supposedly men of God. Right, And you go out and you talk to people that have been abused by one of these people or have known a friend or someone else that's been abused by one of these guys and they want to have nothing to do with church. They want to have nothing to do with God or the ways of God right. and because of that one reprobate, that pervert, that false prophet that, that makes the way of truth be evil spoken of. Because they, in their head they just look at this like, well, this is what God's all about. I want nothing to do with that. But see, I mean, obviously that's a, that's a bad attitude to have because that's just one person. I mean, you can't judge God based off of some false prophet. But see, that's what they do. I mean, they're out there to deceive. They're out there to destroy people and not to bring people to Christ. They might look good on the outside. They might, they might sound good or say things that, that you might like to hear, but they're liars. They're false prophets. And we're going to expose a bunch of them this morning because there's a lot of people out there that get a lot of followers. There's a lot of people that get sucked into this. And if you're not careful, you can get sucked into it too. Obviously, we need to know our Bibles and, and, and compare everything that people say against the truth, against the word of truth, to know that what's being taught is if it's true or not. Look at verse number three again. Because this, this, this whole chapter gives a little, like it, it describes these false prophets, it describes their attributes. So you can kind of know a little bit about them and what they're all about. And the Bible does not paint a very pretty picture for these people at all. Look at verse number 3. It says, And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. Now one thing you'll notice about false prophets is the vast majority of time they're in it for the money. Mm -hmm. They're preaching for filthy lucre's sake. So they're going to say things yeah. that they're going to think that you want to hear because guess what? If that makes you feel good, if, they, if, they're, if they're saying things that you want to hear, that's a lot more likely for you to throw money in the plate than to support them. You're not going to hear them oftentimes preach against sin. You're not going to hear them preach the truth out of the Bible. They're just going to pick and choose certain things. They're going to twist it. They're going to man manipulate it. And they're preaching for filthy lucre's sake because they're filled with covetousness. They just, want, they just want more and more things. And it says they're going to make merchandise of you mm -hmm. whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not. These people are damned. They're already damned. Mm -hmm. Look at, skip down to verse number 12 in 2 Peter 2. Because it, it, the Bible, again, this is not a pretty picture. And this is why I'm preaching about this this morning. Because the Bible talks about this. It's so serious. Look at verse number 12. It says, but these as natural brute beasts. Now, a natural brute, that word brute basically means like stupid. Right? Yeah. Just a dumb animal. As, just, as dumb animals made to be taken and destroyed. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the false prophet saying, there's some stupid animal that you just need to put down. Yeah. They're just made to be taken and destroyed. 
I mean, that would be like if you just have some, you know, some dog that just attacks people all the time and attacks kids or whatever. I mean, that's just a dumb animal. You just got to put that dog down. You just have to put them out of their misery. Just, just destroy them. That's what the, the, God, the Bible is saying that these people are likened unto. They're made to be taken and destroyed. They speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. They don't understand the Bible. In order to understand the Bible, first of all, you have to be saved. You have to have the Spirit inside of you in order to even understand the Word of God. Otherwise, you're, you're, you know, you're going to be blinded still. When you get saved, the, the blind comes off, the blindfold comes off, and you can, you can see clearly, and you can understand God's Word. It's spiritually understood. You have to have the Spirit of God in order to understand the Bible. The false prophets are not saved, obviously. They don't have the Spirit of God. They don't understand it. They speak evil of the things that they understand not. They're just talking about something they know nothing about. They claim to know about the Bible, but they don't know anything about it. And the Bible says they're going to utterly perish in their own corruption. Look at verse number 13. It says, And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. So again, another reference saying, look, they're going to be eating with you. They're going to be feasting with you. They're going to be among you. Just like Judas Iscariot was among the disciples. He was in Jesus, Jesus' church. He was, he was one of the twelve. But he was a false prophet. He was, he was not of God. He was never saved. And, and um, you know, the Bible says he was a devil from the beginning. They're going to be among you. Now, it doesn't mean just you should be on the lookout like, wait, you're a false prophet. You know, <laughs> like just accusing people. You don't want to accuse people. Obviously, but, but see, it also gives you a reason not, you, you shouldn't just have blind trust in people either. You know, give everyone the benefit of the doubt, but you also, you know, that's, what, that's one of the reasons why we don't let our kids go with anybody. And it's not because we don't like you, it's not because, you know, I, but it is because we don't trust you. I mean, we trust God, right. you know, and, and there's different levels of trust, you know. I'll lend my bicycle out. <laughs> I'm, I'm not worried about that, but see, anything that I get rid of, I'm okay with just never, ever getting again. I mean, that's something you already have to decide if you're going to lend something to someone. Just be prepared to just never see it again. And if that's okay, then, then that's the case. You know, whatever. But I'm not okay with my kids never seeing them again. Mm -hmm. So that's just, you know, kind of level of trust you give to someone. But, um, you know, these, these false prophets, um, they're going to be feasting with you. So, you know, again, you don't know who they might be necessarily. The disciples didn't know it was Judas. They all thought it was themselves when Jesus said that someone was going to betray me. So, you can't just go, oh, you know, just always be like, you know, on the lookout for that. Obviously, we need to be aware. We need, you know, need to be aware of these things. But just not accusatory, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Um, well, let's continue on here because they're, they'll be around. But what, I'm not even preaching necessarily about the false, you know, the, the false teachers within our church. Like the reprobates that come into the church. I'm talking more about the false prophets that are out there already that are, that are preaching and teaching to churches and, and on the internet or whatever. It says in verse 14, again, more attributes of the false prophet having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin. I mean, these are people that just, they can't stop sinning. Like they're just, they're just so, you know, their eyes are just full of adultery just all the time. And, and it's hard to, you know, we got to read this and understand this because sometimes it's hard for a normal person to even understand that there's people out there that are just that wicked. They're just, they're just that bad of a person that like, they're just constantly sinning. I mean, you know, I mean, yeah, we're all sinners. You know, I probably sin every day, but it's not like you're just, you just are constantly in sin, like just all the time. I mean, you cannot stop from sinning. Like you just, you just can't stop and that's what the Bible's saying that these people are. It says the beguiling, unstable souls. And that's what like, they do. They're tricking. So unstable souls are people who are, you know, unstable in God's word. Maybe they don't have very much knowledge. Maybe they're children. Whatever it may be, they're out there trying to trick and deceive people who don't know that much. Unstable souls. And a heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozor, who love the wages of unrighteousness. So again, this is a reference to someone in the Old Testament, a false teacher, Balaam, who, the re, you know, again, it's, these people are all tied up in money. He loved the wages of unrighteousness. Balaam was hired to curse the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. And that's why he wanted to go do it, because he was going to get a paycheck. And that's exactly what these false teachers do. I mean, they're, they're in it for the money. They're interested in getting money. 
and they're going to preach whatever, and they're, going to, they're not going to care about the right way. They've forsaken the right way. And then it goes on and says, He was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumbass speaking with man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh. So they allure to people through, through the lust, through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness. Those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. They promise salvation. They'll say, oh yeah, you know, I, I've got the truth for you. I've got salvation. I've got liberty. You know, we've got liberty for you. But they, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought in bondage. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to expose some, some very popular false prophets that are out there this morning. And these guys, the, the people I'm going to name, are, you know, they're, they have a lot of books. They're very widely known on the internet. They have big churches, you know, and they have big followings. Almost cult-like followings in some of these cases. And I'm going to expose them to you. And, and here's why I'm going to expose them to you. Because a lot of people think like, oh, you know, you shouldn't be attacking, you know, those people because that's just going to hurt the cause of Christ. You just have all this division among Christians. And people who aren't Christian are going to look at that and be like, oh, what's all this fighting about? They're not going to have anything to do with church. No, no, absolutely not. Because the Bible says that we are to point out the false prophets. And that's exactly what these people are now. If I have a difference of opinion with someone else who saved another preacher that's, that's preaching God's word, and we have a difference of I'm not just going to call them out and just say, like, there's some false prophet. There's a huge difference here between people who are saved and people who know the truth and people who preach the truth and someone who's just, just blatantly a false prophet who has a different gospel. Turn to Galatians chapter 1, if you would. Galatians chapter number 1. Because I'm going to show you a few verses here before I get into this. This is all by way of introduction on, on, on exposing these false prophets. Galatians chapter 1 explains that you're not supposed to just, you know, people who have a false gospel, they need to be pointed out. Verse number 6 of Galatians chapter 1 says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ, into the grace of Christ, unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So here he's saying, look, how are you so soon removed? Like, like he preached the gospel to the, to, the, to the people of Galatia. He preached the gospel of Galatians, the true gospel, the word of God. And he's saying, how are you so soon removed from this unto another gospel? The people came up already after these people were saved, after they had heard the gospel of truth. People were coming in, these false prophets, these false teachers are saying, you know, twisting the gospel of Christ. Where he said, it's not another gospel. It's not some completely different gospel of salvation. It's not telling you just a whole nother way to get saved, you know, just, just with has nothing to do with Christ. And just, you know, it's just completely separate. He said, no, they perverted the gospel of Christ. So they've taken the actual gospel and just twisted it and perverted it and changed it a little bit. These are the people who like to add works to salvation. They say, oh, yeah, 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 you got to believe in Christ to be saved. But you also got to live a good life. I mean, you also got to read the Bible. You also got to get baptized. You also got to, you know, whatever it is. That's a perversion of the gospel. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, as soon as they pervert that gospel, it's no longer true. I mean, people who believe that to be saved, you believe you have to have your good works. In addition to believing in Christ, you're not saved. It's, good. it's that simple. I mean, it has to be faith alone. That is the true gospel. Anyone who adds to that, they perverted the gospel. Now look at what Paul says that, that you need to do about this. Look at verse number 8, it says, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Mm -hmm. That's not about putting a curse on somebody. That's not even just saying, oh, you know, walk away from them or don't say anything. No, let him be accursed. If someone's bringing you a false gospel, and look, at, I like what it says here too, because it says, but though we are an angel from heaven. Now, what does the Mormon church teach where they got their information from? Yep. An angel from heaven, yep. right? They claim an angel from heaven gave them this news about how to be saved you know, and, and gave them the, their book of Mormon, mm -hmm. which is, teaches a false gospel, which they teach work salvation. They need to be a curse. You know, the, the people who are teaching this, these false gospels, if someone comes to you saying, no, you have to have works to be saved, let them be accursed. And that's what Paul's saying, and that's what I'm doing this morning. We're going to let them be accursed. There's a few more verses you don't have to turn there. Jude, 
Jude is, a, is another chapter that um, is, is a parallel passage. 2 Peter chapter 2 is all about false prophets. Well, the book of Jude, there's only one chapter in Jude, is the same thing. There's a few places in Scripture where it's like this, where basically a parallel passage, they deal with the exact same topics, and oftentimes you'll see very, very similar or the same words being used in both of them. And, and God's giving us like a few different places where you could learn about the same subject. Jude follows up with, with 2 Peter chapter number 2 very, very closely. But in Jude 1, 3, the Bible says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation... It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So Paul's saying again here in Jude, or I'm sorry, in Jude, the, um, not Paul, but in Jude, the, the book saying in, in verse 3, that you need to earnestly contend for the faith. It's a fight. It's a battle. We're contending for the faith. In verse 4, it says, for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And then in Romans 16, it tells us that we need to mark these people. Mark means like to, 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 to you know, set them apart and say, look, this person right here, we're going to mark them and avoid them. Romans 16, 17, says, now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. Have nothing to do with them. It says, for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Again, they're in it to feed their own belly. They're in it for the money. They're in it for their own gain. And they deceive the hearts of the simple. The simple, I mean, that's the people who don't really understand. You don't understand God's word. That's why it's so important. Again, get yourself founded. Read the Bible. Read the Bible every day. Get this learning and get this knowledge inside of you because this is where your two true doctrines are going to come from and this is going to prevent you from being deceived by people who are just out to make merchandise of you and just out to make a buck off of you. They're going to lie to you. Now I'm going to get into some of these people and every single one of these people, I actually spend a little bit of time researching because I've, I heard of some of these people but I never really knew much about them. All I knew is what I had heard from other people. So before I'm going to go and expose someone as a false prophet, there are a few of these people, I because I didn't know very much about them, I had, I had to see it for myself. Yeah. And, and, and always, you know, don't throw around a term like false prophet loosely either. Mm. I've got some people here I'm going to name. It's not, I mean, we saw the condemnation on these people. You saw how serious the Bible treats them. It's not a term you just throw around loosely, Okay. But when you got people who are preaching a damnable heresies, these false doctrines, especially about salvation, and that's really mainly what I'm just going to be getting into on all these people is that their salvation is just completely wrong. And not only that, like this first person, Paul Washer, he's someone who actually goes and he attacks the Baptists. He attacks soul winners. He attacks people who actually go out and try to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in his preaching. I heard a few of his sermons where he's just, I mean, he's making fun of people. Now, he's very, very slick. I was listening to him. I was thinking, wow, I can see how a man like that can deceive the simple, how he can deceive the unlearned, because he is very slick. He, I mean, I was listening to him. I was just like, boom, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, like, that's wrong. But what he does is, basically, he, he builds a straw man. So he builds an argument and, and obviously, anytime you're preaching, you can do that. I mean, you could, you could say, you know, this is what this person does, and this is why it's wrong. And you, and you kind of are controlling both sides of the argument. But what he does, he'll attack people, he'll attack the soul winning especially, and he uses some truth, just like all of them do. Mm -hmm. They're going to use some truth because that's how they suck you in, because it sounds like, oh, okay, yeah, I know that, that's true. And then you start listening to everything else, some of the other things are not, and they make these, these assumptions and um, so basically what he does, one of the big things he was saying is that he, one of the big reasons he attacks soul winning is that he talks about people who claim to be saved. And we asked him, why are you saved? He said, well, because I pray to prayer. And what he does is, and, and of course, so you look at that and say, well, yeah, just praying a prayer doesn't get you saved. But that's all he ever says when he's, when he's talking about soul winning Baptists. He just says he, he condemns the, the whole thing. Because he says some people say that they just they pray to prayer and that's why they're saved. Well, 
We go out and we get people to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. And then they call upon the name of the Lord because, um, you know, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? I mean, it's very simple. It's very blatant in Scripture. And it's very scriptural for people to pray to God and ask him to save them. After they put their faith on him and they, they believe on him to get saved. But if, you, you know, if someone were to ask me, you know, why are you saved? I wouldn't say because I prayed a prayer. Yeah. And the people that I talk to and the people that, you know, when I go out soul winning and people who actually receive Christ as their Savior, I don't know if any single one of them would say, well, I just prayed a prayer. Because that doesn't save you. So he takes something like that and he'll just say, oh, yeah, which, which okay, yeah, that's true. I mean, you can't just say just because you prayed a prayer, you're saved. But he, he never brings up the fact that, well, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved. Because then he tries to go around, basically what he tries to do is like, Proving people aren't saved because they don't do good works. And that's his big thing. And, and we're going to see all these people I'm gonna, that, I, that I bring up. None of them are going to say, we believe in works. They all package it in a different way. <laughs> they, all, they, all, they all try to mix it in there. Because there's too, there's too much scriptural evidence that just flat out says that you're not saved by works. Yeah, at all. I mean, there's, there's, so they can't just come out and say... You have to have works to be saved. They'll all say, well, you don't need it to be saved, but if you don't have the works, then, then you're not saved. And I was listening to this guy, Paul Washington. He was, I mean, he was up there, and he gets, he gets real emotional, and he tries to get people, basically, he's getting everyone, like, he's probably getting everyone in the room to doubt, like, am I even saved? <laughs> now, if you've got a bunch of unsaved people, there's nothing wrong with that. But the, but the reason why it's a bad way of saying it is that, I mean, he brought up an example of a child saying that if, if a child is saved, basically when he disobeys his mother or his father, that he should have this gut-wrenching, just, just this horrible feeling. How can I have done something so horrible and wicked as to have disobeyed my parents? And he brings out like saying, like, you think you're saved, and if you're not having that feeling, then like, you better check your salvation. It's so like, it's ridiculous. There are a lot of kids that are, that are saved because they put their faith in Christ, yep. that disobey their parents, and they're not going to have that just, just horrible, guttural, like, like, what did I do? I can't believe I did this. And just, and, you know, yeah. and it's insane. But this is what this guy teaches and preaches. And he teaches that about, about everything. And, and he uses examples from Scripture. It's funny because it's easy to prove salvation by grace and faith alone as just by believing. And, I mean, there's hundreds, if not thousands of verses that, that just, I mean, it's, it's faith, it's faith, it's faith, it's only believing. He never goes to anything like that. He'll go to, like, a parable and just try to explain, like, well, and it's always logic, too. So these, these false prophets are going to just try to logic you out. They'll make, they make false assumptions on the Bible. So, like, they'll say one thing that's true, maybe, and then they'll, they'll make an assumption or they'll make a statement that's not true and then build off of that. Now... The parts that they say that are true, they'll use the Bible to try to prove that. Right? They'll show you a verse and they'll say, yeah, see, see, it says right here. And then they go and make a statement that's false, never go and prove that, and then continue on with their point from that false foundation. And, you, and, and I was listening to Paul Washer. I mean, he, he brings up a lot of scripture. It's not just, I mean, some of these guys, there's like no scripture at all, or maybe one verse, and they're just blah, 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 blah. Paul Washer, and, and obviously Paul Washer, it's not real scripture. I mean, he's using from a false version to begin with. I mean, he's using mm -hmm. just some, some, not the King James Bible, some other false perversion of it. But he does bring up different verses to try to prove his point. But see, like, the key is when he makes the false statement without, without proving anything from scripture and then continues on from there. <laughs> and he skews the path. He perverts the truth and just gets you going down the wrong path. And, and that guy, man, and, and he, he's a powerful speaker when you listen to him. Like, I think it's kind of a joke, but like, I could see where a lot of people could just kind of get sucked into him and, and listen to him. But um, he, um, he convinces a lot of people. He's got a lot of following out there, especially online. I mean, people, people post his sermons and stuff all the time because supposedly he's, you know, real hard on sin and stuff like that. But the guy's a joke. 
The second guy that, that I want to point out is John MacArthur. Now, John MacArthur preaches a lordship salvation. Yeah. He preaches that you have to deny yourself completely, like, like you just, like you have no, I mean, like nothing of yourself, and completely submit yourself to the will of Christ to where, like, he becomes your Lord in the sense that anything that you tell me to do and anything that, you know, all of the law, everything that I'm supposed to do, I'm going to do to you. I'm going to do for you. And you're my Lord and I'm your servant. And like, that's the attitude you have to have in order to be saved. Now, again, we know that salvation. I'm not going to prove salvation by grace through faith. We all know that. But you see how they'll, they'll take something like, should we be like that? Of course. Should we, you know, should we obey all the commandments and 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 have that that respect for God and and just and just be willing and to give our lives and devote it for Him and do everything for Him? Of course we should. And that's the truth part of it that that they're mixing in. But then you, when you, when you start saying, well, that's what you need to be saved. That's a works based salvation. That's obeying the law to be saved. That is false. That is false doctrine. They'll say you have to make Jesus the Lord of your life. And they'll say this, you have to turn from your sin. Every, every single one of these guys without fail, every single one of them teaches you have to turn from your sin. You have to repent of your sin. And that's a whole other sermon of itself. But real quickly, you do not have to turn from your sins to be saved. You have to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, as the Bible says repeatedly over and over and over again. Because if you truly turned from your sin you wouldn't sin anymore. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as you sin, it just proves you didn't turn from your sin because you sinned. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's stupidity to say you have to turn from your sins in order to be saved. Every single one of these guys will teach that. And in Jonah, chapter number two, it teaches that, you know, when you turn from your wicked works, um, or you turn from your wicked ways, that's works. The Bible defines turning from your wicked ways as works. If you have to turn from your sin, turn from your wickedness, turn from your wicked ways in order to be saved, you're just automatically saying, well, yeah, I believe in works. And that's what all of these guys do. Now, the other thing about John MacArthur, now, John MacArthur, he's got, like, he's got Bible study Bibles, like, like the John MacArthur study Bible. He's got all kinds of stuff out there with his name on it, and he's got a big following. But he also denies that we are saved by the blood of Christ. What he does... And he's very, and, and again, they're very tricky with this. He'll make a statement like that and he'll say, oh, well, the blood is only talking about the death of Christ as a metaphor. Like he's just saying, well, anytime it's talking about, you know, we're saved through the blood, well, yeah, it's because Jesus died for us. And he says that the, the blood is used. He says, yeah, it's a graphic image. And, you know, there was the, um, the, the sacrifices in the Old Testament stuff. And, you know, the blood's important, but it's, that's not, it's, his actual blood is not what saves you. Well, I've got some verses here from the Bible, you know, and, and I hate to confuse you with the Bible, John MacArthur, but I'm going to just blow through these for you. You don't have to turn to these, but Hebrews 9, verse 18 says, Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood, for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and and all the people saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. The blood here, I mean, he's, he's very specifically saying blood, blood, blood. It's got to be sprinkled in the blood. The blood is used. It's sprinkled on the, on the book. It's sprinkled on the, on the, the tabernacle. It's sprinkled, you know, within the tabernacle, all the vessels of ministry. Without shedding of blood is no remission. Romans 3.25, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Romans 5.9, much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians 2, 13, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Colossians 1, 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. 
Hebrews 13, 12, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. 1 Peter 1, 2 says, Elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Now, he'll say that the blood is used as a metaphor. That blood just means the death of. Well, if you were to replace, you know, the word blood with just his death, okay, the sprinkling of the death of Jesus Christ? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you can't, you're not sprinkling death. This is all about sprinkling blood. Because they sprinkled the blood in the Old Testament on all the vessels and on the Holy Book and on the people themselves. Moses, they, they sprinkled that blood. And it's not, I mean, obviously there's a lot of metaphors in the Bible, and, and even the blood can be used as a metaphor, but it's not just that. I mean, the Bible specifically, flat out in all these verses, says, in 1 John 1, 7, in the last verse, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. These false prophets, see, they'll, they'll say these things, and they'll make these bold statements, but then they, and then they try to make it like, oh, well, no, 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 I just mean that it's a metaphor, and it's blood... That's heresy. I mean, the Bible is over, and that's not all verses, by the way. I just picked out some of them that talk about us being cleansed from our sin, being righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood is extremely important. Don't get sucked into this nonsense that these false prophets teach out there. The next prophet, it's hard to even call him a prophet. I mean, the Bible uses the word false prophets, but... Um, you can't even really call him a preacher, Joel Osteen. I mean, this guy, talk about, I don't see how even unsaved people can't see through this guy. I honestly can't see it. I mean, he's got that smile all the time, and he's just like, I mean, everything's good. And, but he, and what he preaches, he teaches that prosperity, the health and wealth gospel. He's just like, and talk about self-help. I mean, this guy's just all about and, you know, bettering yourself and having your best life now, and all these things. And I actually suffered through an entire sermon of his. I'm trying to find the most popular stuff on these people, too. So I go to Google, and I'm just like, you know, just like Joel Osteen, like, what's the number one thing that comes up? And I found a sermon that's endorsed by Oprah Winfrey. Wow. And if you're not aware, Oprah Winfrey is like this new age, just wicked, wicked I mean horrible, horribly wicked person. I mean, Oprah Winfrey is, is just like <laughs> almost evil embodied like with, with what she believes. I mean, she is yeah. just, she's yeah. so into this new age she's... stuff and she endorses this sermon. That's already a bad mark for you, Joel. I'm sorry. If she's, if she's coming up and saying that, you know, Oprah Winfrey's in power or is endorsing you, that's not good. And the, the title of her sermon is called The Power of I Am. You would think with a title like that, you would think at least one time he would make reference to the fact that in the, in the burning bush, when Moses saw God, God said that his name was I Am. Not one time in the whole sermon. And his whole sermon was devoted to you saying, I am a good person. I am beautiful. I am you know, like, like ma basically making yourself God. Yeah, exactly. Not relying on God. Not trusting in Him for this stuff. He makes everything about you. And that's what He says, the power of I am. So you have this power when you say, I am this and I am that. And it's all about not having like a negative attitude on things. And it's nothing more than that self-help philosophy. And you know what else is interesting the entire time, all he kept going back to was physical appearances mm -hmm. and finances. Mm -hmm. That's like all he talked about the whole time. Like that's what really matters. Mm -hmm. Like that is what's so important in a, any person's life is, is how you physically appear or how much money you have. And that just, I mean, this guy, you want to talk about, you know, false prophet to a T. This guy's got the whole Colosseums packed out, mm -hmm. passing the plates around multiple times, paying to get into them, and whatever else they do. I mean, this guy's got, I mean, he's in it for the money. Yeah. And he clearly has the wrong I am, because obviously I am is the Lord. 
And he was teaching, again, yeah, this sermon was so crazy. You have to have your own I am. And again, he wasn't teaching you have to rely on God. He was just teaching basically just to trust in yourself. And he has this prayer, right? At the end of his sermon, he had this prayer. And I, and I wrote down verbatim what he said. I had to go back a couple times and write down word for word. So at the end of his whole sermon, he's got this little video clip, and he's like, okay, you know, if you, or not a video clip, but just at the end, just, you know, basically his salvation prayer. He said, you know, if you want to be saved, just say, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. Come into my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior. If you prayed that simple prayer, we believe you got born again. This is the type of person that, you know, Paul Washer should be saying, you know, like, yeah, that's wrong. That's obviously false. If someone just repeats those words and says that prayer, are they saying? No. Not if they just repeat those words, especially not if they're saying, I repent of my sins. Mm -hmm. I make you my Lord. Like, like that's, again, just, just total works-based salvation. And one of the... <laughs> Another true testament to, to his, just being a false prophet, he was on the Larry King Live show. And he was interviewed by Larry King Live. And this is, this is, this is all over there. You can check this out. He said, because he would not make a stance on salvation at all. Like, he, he keeps dodging. He's like a politician. He just, like, dodges these questions. And Larry King's just trying to say, well, look, I mean, you believe the Bible, right? Like, that's your belief? Like, and he's trying to get him to say at least that somebody is wrong. Like, like, if you believe this, isn't anybody else wrong then? Like, I mean, even an atheist, right? I mean, someone who just doesn't believe in God at all, can you at least say that, well, yeah, that person will go to hell if they don't believe on Christ? He was just trying to get him to say this. And he kept, he's just dodging and just, just giving these stupid answers. And he said, he doesn't know if a Jesus-denying Muslim or even an atheist would go to heaven. He would just say, like, I don't know. He said, he said I'll, I'll leave that to God. He'll say, God can judge. Talk about a false prophet. Not even being able, willing just to say that, like, you have to believe on Jesus Christ to be saved. Couldn't even say that. Well, that, that's what I believe, but, but God will judge. What, I mean, what he's doing, best case scenario, is giving people false hope, thinking they're like, oh, well, maybe I am saved then. I mean, you know, like, <laughs> according to this guy. And he said he spent a lot of time in India. And he said, I don't know a lot about their religion, but, but I know that they love God. That's what he said. Now, India, I mean, they have their um, Hindu religion. And they, I mean, they believe all kinds of weird things. They believe in the animals, and I think they believe in reincarnation and all this other stuff. They are not, that is not the God of the Bible. It's a false God that they worship, and their religion is, is, not, is not the truth. And he said, he said, I've seen their sincerity. So basically, according to him, if you're sincere in your heart to some God, just any God that you make up. So, I mean, you know, the people in the Bible that had their false gods that they believed in so much that they would cast their children through the fire and, and offer their child sacrifices. He would say, well, they're sincere. So they must be going to heaven because they believe in their God and they're so sincere they're willing to sacrifice their own children. Wow. That's wickedness. But that's the gospel that he preaches, and he ought to be a, he's accursed. Joel Osteen, you're accursed. You teach a false gospel. You're a false prophet. You're just in it for the money. You don't care about people. You make merchandise out of them. John Hagee's another one. <clears throat> what is this quote? I have this quote here. He says, oh, in his salvation prayer, he says, the Bible says to repent and believe the good news. Repent means to turn away, to walk and go another direction. So again, just typifying, well, you need to live this good life in order to repent and believe the gospel. And his salvation prayer, this is his salvation prayer. He says, come into my heart today and be the Lord of my life. I will serve you. I will obey you. I will read your word and will follow Christ from this day forward all the days of my life. Jesus, you are now my Lord and Savior, and I am your servant. Amen. That's his salvation prayer. That's how he ends his salvation prayer, saying, you know, I'm going to obey. Now think about this. If he's getting people even to say that, like, do you know how many people he's getting to lie? Mm-hmm. And just, I mean, just by saying you're going to, from this day forward, all the days of my life, I'm going to read the Bible and I'm going to follow and obey your commandments all, every single day. 
Like you're getting people now to make a false vow unto God. I mean, the Bible is very serious about making a vow. And the Bible says to keep your vows and, and don't open your mouth foolishly unto God. He's not only get, you know, deceiving people on salvation, he's getting them to sin upon that just by making a vow or a promise to God. That's something that they're not going to be able to follow. You can't follow that. I mean, he's not even saying, like, I'm going to try to do that. He's saying, no, I will do that. That's his prayer. And he also has a book, it's called In Defense of Israel. And he claims that the Jewish people as a whole did not reject Jesus as Messiah. You cannot get more unscriptural than that. I mean, like, the Bible is clear. Look, the Jews did. But here's what he says. He says, he claims that Jesus did not come to the earth to be the Messiah. He says, he says not why I claim. He said that since Jesus refused to claim to be the Messiah, how can the Jews be blamed? Wow. For, for rejecting him. Totally missing the verses where Jesus is obviously, you know, the woman at the well, you know, who, you know, when Messiah's coming, he'll, you know, he'll, he'll, he knows all things, he'll teach us in all truth. And then he says, well, Messiah has already come. He's like, well, you know, where is he? He says, I that speaketh unto thee am he. Did he claim to be Messiah, the Christ? Yeah, he did. In more than one place, that's just one example. But again, if you don't know the Bible, then see what he does then. He'll, he'll go to the verses where Jesus is being interrogated, interrogated by Herod, and he doesn't answer him, right? Or when they say, art thou the Christ? And he says, thou sayest it. Mm -hmm. So he'll turn to those verses, he'll turn to that scripture and say, see, see, how could you blame him? He's not claiming to be the Christ, so how, you know, you can't blame him for rejecting him because he didn't even say he was. But if you don't know the whole Bible, it's, it's clear, obvious. Yes, he did, and yes, he was. And that's, I mean, that's still just twisting the scripture anyways. I mean, what about all the miracles? I mean, just, just all the yeah. proofs that he had, the, 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 the prophecies he fulfilled within his lifetime from the scripture. I mean, there's just no excuse for it. And, and this guy's saying he didn't even claim to be Messiah. John Agee is a false prophet. Now this last one. I want you to listen to this first because this guy is really popular. And just like Joel Osteen, he says he can't judge whether or not you know, a Muslim is saved. Here's an interview that he did with this guy Robert Schuler, And I'm going to give you the, the, the transcript here. So Schuler asks this question to this guy. He says, tell me, what do you think is the future of Christianity? And he answers, well... Christianity and being a true believer, you know, I think there's the body of Christ. This comes from all the Christian groups around the world, outside the Christian groups. I think everybody that loves Christ or knows Christ, whether they're conscious of it or not, they're members of the body of Christ. And I don't think that we're going to see a great sweeping revival that will turn the whole world to Christ at any time. I think James answered that, the Apostle James in the first council in Jerusalem, when he said that God's purpose for this age is to call out a people for his name. And that's what God is doing today. He's calling people out of the world for his name, whether they come from the Muslim world or the Buddhist world or the Christian world or the non-believing world. They are members of the body of Christ because they've been called by God. They may not even know the name of Jesus, he says, wow. but they know in their hearts that they need something that they don't have. And they turn to the only light that they have, and I think that they are saved and that they're going to be with us in heaven. Who is not saved under that, under that, <laughs> under that understanding? Now, that is just ridiculous. And here's the thing, the people that like this guy, if they heard anybody say that, they would say, no way is that guy saved. That is a false prophet. He's teaching that Muslims, Buddhists, whoever, if you just think that you need something that you don't have, you don't even need to know the name of Jesus to be saved. The Bible says there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved by the name of Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says, and he's saying they don't even have to know the name of Jesus. They don't even have to know the God of the Bible. They just have to just, just know that they need something and just follow whatever lights. Now, is there even any light coming from false gods? No, it's all darkness. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. These false gods, there's no light in them. 
They don't have a light. That was Billy Graham who said that. Mm -hmm. Billy Graham is called, you know, America's preacher. Billy Graham, I go out, I talk to a lot of, we have older people in this community, I talk to people, and they got nothing but good things to say about Billy Graham. Mm -hmm. All the time, I mean, people are just like, oh, Billy Graham, he's so wonderful, he's so great. I watch him, I read his books, you know, I got saved at Billy Graham Crusade and all this other stuff. It's funny, people that get saved, like, it's because he did these big ecumenical things. He got people from, from all these different Christians' faith. And it's always the Baptists that gave him the gospel that got him saved yeah. if, they, if they showed up to all these Billy Graham crusades. But you, these Billy Graham fans, and, and, and I'm sorry to break it to you, Billy Graham fans, but you cannot deny, I mean, this is out of his own word. This is the words out of his own mouth. This is published online. I mean, like, you, it is so easy to find this information. I mean, you could find it like that. You go to Google and type Billy Graham Robert Schuller, and number one, two, three, four, five, like, like you'll probably have a whole page of this same exact interview where he claim, makes his claim. And I'm sorry, that is not out of context. There is no way you could spin these words to say, oh, well, that's not really what he meant. He's saying you don't have to know the name of Jesus Christ and, work, and that he thinks they're saved and they're going to be in heaven. He also did an interview with... Uh, with um, Larry King live, and he basically had the same the same outcome as Joel Osteen. <laughs> the same exact thing. And like I said before, none of these guys are going to claim to believe in work salvation. They're just not going to flat out say it because that's too obvious. They're a lot more slick than that. They're a lot more subtle. Now, the Joel Osteen and the Billy Graham, I mean, those are extremely damning statements. Those are those are pretty easy to pick up on, even if you're not that learned in the Bible. I mean. As long as if you're saved, something like that should kind of come across as like, whoa, what are you talking about? But they're deceivers, they're false prophets. The other guys, you know, the John MacArthur's and the, and the Paul Washer's, they're a lot more subtle. They're a lot trickier in, in, in their, in their false um, teachings and their heresies. But they all are going to tell you that you have to turn from your sin in order to be saved. <laughs> These false prophets, they frustrate the grace of God. The Bible says Galatians 2.21, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. <clears throat> and most of the men I mentioned are very well loved by the world. You think of Billy Graham? I mean, like, I mean, he, is the, he, was, the pre, he was at the presidential inaugura inaugurations for many years. I mean, he was the one holding out the Bible. The president was, you know, he's loved by the world. I mean, he's loved by the politicians. He's just loved by, like, all denominations of people, just whoever it is. I mean, everybody loves Billy Graham. The Bible says in Luke 6, 26, Jesus Christ said, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ said, look, there's something wrong. If you got a preacher that's loved by all men, that's a big red flag there because that's exactly how the false prophets were viewed in his day. And that's, you know... The false prophets are the one that killed the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's funny how the argument against, you know, easy believism, that's what we believe here, by the way. Easy believism. Because it's easy to put your faith on Jesus Christ, and it's just by believing in his blood that he shed for us to be saved. It's, good. it's easy. And these people, these heretics, they have these arguments and they'll say, oh, well, you're giving people a license to sin. If you just tell them that all they have to do is believe, then they can just go out and do whatever they want. He says, you can't tell people that all of their sins are forgiven, then they'll just go out and just do whatever they want. Well, the funny thing is, I don't just go out and do whatever I want. I mean, the people in our church don't just live however they want, just go out, do whatever they want, and just, and just think, oh, cool, I'm saved. I'm just going to go out and just sin as much as possible and sin it up because I'm saved. It's ridiculous. But besides that, it's like, you use an argument like that, but that's not an argument found in the Bible. I mean, the reason why we believe what we believe is because of what the Scripture says. You can't just take the, like, can't say like, oh, well, I believe that salvation is only by grace through faith. Once you're saved, you're saved forever. It's an eternal gift. And then someone else just says, well, you, you can't say that because of, you know, X, Y, and Z. That's not in the Bible. I mean, just because someone might do something or someone might not, you know, love God enough to try to follow his commandments, well, it's still, the Bible says what it says. And, you know, it's either true or it's not. And, um, and it's, it's also funny, too, that the same people that claim you have to live a righteous life, in addition to believing, 
they're living, <laughs> not, you know, the vast majority of times, they're living in way more sin than the people that actually go out and proclaim that salvation is a free gift. I mean, we, we teach, it can't be any freer. There's nothing you have to do besides believe, yet the standards that we, we uphold in this church are, are higher than, than the standards of any church that I've ever been to besides you know, the church that I came from, which teaches the exact same thing that we teach here. The standards that we uphold and we try to, to keep ourselves to God, I mean, I'll match up our living standards against any of these false prophets that say, oh, you have to live by the law and you have to do good things and good works to be saved. It's funny how that works out. It's because of whom much has been forgiven, you know, they loveth much. When you know you're forgiven, we love God, we're going we're to keep His commandments. And those that are teaching the false, the false prophets, of the false salvation on works, they don't love God. Now, man, I've got a whole section here. I'm, I'm not going to, I don't have time to get to all this stuff. Real briefly, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to cover... Because this is all on the same thing. There's a very common proof that these people, and I'm getting some of these from the from the sermons I listen to. I mean, I'm not going to go over and expose the entire sermon of these false prophets I listen to. But very common abused by these false prophets that teach work salvations is the idea of having fruit. They say, by the fruits you shall know them. And the people always say that. say, like, well, see, if you don't do good works, then you're not saved. And we heard this out soul winning too. Chad and I, we were talking to a guy that, and, and again, this, this guy was, he was deceived by the people that I already mentioned. He was deceived by the John MacArthur's and by the Paul Washers, thinking that like, well, in order, you know, if you're saved, then you'll just automatically have all these good works. And they, and they, they, they twist scripture. They'll, they'll take scripture and talk about fruit. Now, Genesis chapter one describes the basic concept of fruit. Okay. And, and we're going to break it down really simple here. It's going to be about five more minutes. Real simple. The basic concept of just fruit. Okay. Genesis 1 verse 11 says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. So here we see a fruit tree. It yields fruit, which means it brings forth fruit. After his kind, which means if it's an apple tree, the apple tree is going to bring forth apples. Right? Stay with me here. I know I don't want to go too fast. <laughs> the apple tree is not going to bring forth oranges or pears or bananas or anything like that. It's going to continually bring forth after its kind. And it says the seed is in itself, which is why it continually is able to reproduce. And it continues to grow and reproduce. The seeds are there and it's, and it's this continual process, right? And verse 12 says basically the same thing. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Now, it's important though to understand this concept of fruit because they try to make fruit be something that it's not. Now, of course, obviously, think about, you know, we're talking about trees. Now, does an apple... By itself, I was holding an apple. Is that just going to just break off and make another apple? No. You have to have an apple tree. Does every apple become an apple tree? No. I mean, apples Apples already have like lots of seeds inside. Well, I don't know, like five or six or however many are in an apple. And in order for a tree to be produced, obviously, the apple has to fall to the ground. The seed has to germinate. And, and, and start to sprout and actually start to grow and, and bear root into the ground and, you know, and all these things and, and make it through all the, you know, the, the surrounding environment in order to become a tree. Now that tree will produce hundreds, maybe thousands of apples, you know, whatever. I mean, tree, trees produce a lot of fruit, especially in their lifetime. But how many of those apples are actually going to become another tree that yields fruit? Not very many at all. Not very many. The majority of them are just going to fall aground in their, in their apples. Now, does that mean if, a, if an apple doesn't become an apple tree, does that mean, well, it wasn't really an apple then? <laughs> like, well, I, I, don't see it, I don't see it growing up and bearing any fruit and, and bringing forth more apples. It must not have ever been an apple. It's foolishness. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. The Bible talks about the fruit of the womb you know, and, and people bringing forth fruit, fruit. It's talking about having children because you're bringing forth after your own kind. Now, when the Bible talks about 
the fruit of a Christian, guess what? You're going to be bringing forth other Christians. In order to do that, see, we've received the seed of God's word. That's how we got saved. God's word was planted in our hearts. And, it, and it, when, when we receive it and believe on it, then it's able to start to grow and, 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 bear, and um, you know, build roots and grow within ourselves. And not everybody that's saved and has received that seed becomes a tree that is able to bring forth more fruit after their own kind. A lot of people don't. But it doesn't mean they never got saved. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, some of us do. Some of us have been rooted down in God's Word. We have you know, kept God's Word in our heart and, and, have, and have tried to grow and learn more. And, and the more you grow, the more you're going to be able to win souls to Christ. The Bible says in Proverbs 10, 16, it says, The labor of the righteous tendeth to life, the fruit of the wicked to sin. So the labor, the work of the righteous person is going to bring life, bring life in, you know, through the gospel of Christ. Proverbs 11.30, real famous verse says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Likening here that the, you know, the, the righteous person, you know, is, their fruit is going to be a tree of life that, you know, for winning souls to Christ. Um, man, i got to skip over so much of this stuff. I'm almost out of time. I really want to get so, this. Is just gonna have to be a, this is going to have to be its own sermon by itself because there's so much here. But the, the, the last place I'm going to turn to, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 13 because we're going to go through the parable of the sower. But see, every time the Bible talks about being known by your fruits, and I'm just going to throw this out there. You can look it up for yourself. If you take notes or something, you want to look this up. Anytime that the Bible's talking about being known by your fruits, it's always talking about these false teachers and prophets. Okay? Because again, not every person is a prophet, right? Not every person is a, is a preacher, is a pastor, is a teacher. You know, like not every, every person in the world fits that category. Some people do. It says, so it's not just talking about your average person. I'll blow some of these through these real quick. Matthew 3 says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meet for rep repentance. And on and on, he goes through, like every time he's talking to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, these were false teachers and false prophets. Um, it says in Matthew 7, verse 15, it says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Which is another reason why I'm preaching this sermon is because, look, outwardly they look like sheep, they look harmless. Inwardly they're ravening wolves, they're out to destroy. Mm -hmm. And then it says in verse 16, Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? So when people come to you and say like, oh, well, in order to be saved, you have to, you know, you have to show forth a fruit. He's saying here, he's talking about false prophets. You're going to know the false prophets by their fruits. Which means you can look at a convert from any of these false teachers and, and see, okay, this is the fruit of what they're doing. And analyze that and say, is this of God? Is this, is this really true? You can talk to them. You can see, are they even saved? If someone's a false teacher, they're not going to be getting people saved. They're not going to be winning people to Christ. They're not going to have that fruit that's evidenced in their life. And that's one of the things that I love about, about finding Faithful Word Baptist Church because there's so many things that were right about that church where I started going there. I, I heard the right preaching being preached from the Bible. And I also was able to see the fruit. Here was a man that actually believed in what he said. Here's someone who read the Bible and believed it and did it. And you can see those types of things coming from him that will just help the evidence to, to help prove that he wasn't just some false prophet and some false teacher. You can see the result. You can see the fruit of his labor of what he was doing. And hopefully you'll be able to be, that'll be evidenced here in this church. Every time, but now if you're in Matthew chapter 13, we're going to look at the parable of the sower because a lot of people get this confused too. And it has to do with um, receiving the seed. It says in verse 3 of Matthew 13, And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. 
And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some in hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. Now, in all, there's four examples that he gives here. One where the, the seed falls by the wayside and, the, and the, the birds come and, and eat it up. The other one where there's not much earth, it springs up and then it withers away. There's one where it goes among the thorns and the thorns grow up with it and choke it out. And then the last one is sown in a good ground and it bears fruit. Only one of those cases bears fruit. The other three don't. But here's the thing. Three of the four received the seed and they actually believed in this parable. Jesus explains it and they were saved. So the, the, only, the only one example in this parable that's not saved is the one where you know, the, the birds came and just ate the seed. The seed never, never started even to become anything. It, wasn't, it, it never germinated. It never, it never um, was started to bring forth life. Matthew 13, 18, look at verse 18, he says, Jesus Christ explains it. He says, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not. So this is someone, you can't believe in something. I said this over and over. You can't believe in something that you don't understand, right? So you can't get saved if you don't even understand the gospel. You have to understand it's a free gift. You have to understand that in order to believe it. So this is talking about someone who doesn't understand it. It says, Then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. So first I was saying, look, the gospel was preached on this person. They didn't understand it. So the devil just comes and he just, you know, the, the work that you did, the, the preaching that you did, God's word that you're sowing with that, you know, you're throwing that seed out. So here's God's word and you're, and you're giving it to him. Well, the devil's just going to come and just take that away. When people just, they just don't receive it. They don't understand it. They don't get it. The devil's going to come and say, boom. And that's why you can talk to people about the gospel over and over again. And a lot of times it's like you never said it the first time. And it's like a brand new conversation with them because the devil will come and take that away. Mm -hmm. Verse number 20 says, But he that received the seed in the stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. So he heard it, and he received it. This is someone who received God's word. They believed on it. It says, Yet hath he no root in himself, but doeth for a while, for when tribulation and persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. So he didn't... He didn't you know, take care of it to make, you know, to get himself rooted down and, and planted down and, and grown up. But he still received it. He received the seed. It says, He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. So people who, you know, again, you can receive the seed, you can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you can get saved because you did the one thing that was required by receiving the seed. But then, I mean, you can get caught up in the things of this world. You can start living after your own flesh, which you still have, which your flesh is unchanged after you get saved anyways. You can walk that way, but it doesn't make you not saved. It just means you're not going to be fruitful. You have to put away the lust of the flesh in order to become fruitful. And that's what he says here, the last one, the last story. It says, but he that received seed in the good, the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some in hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And the people that believe in these false doctrines will say that only the last one is saved because he brings forth fruit. And that's clearly not what Jesus was teaching. And you can look at the other examples of this in the, in the other Gospels because it's not the only time that this story is mentioned. But basically, you receive the word, you receive Jesus Christ, and, and that's how you get saved. Now, watch out for these false teachers and these false prophets. There's a long list. I cut some out, and apparently I didn't cut out enough because we ran a little over tonight, today. But, um, but <clears throat> always compare what you hear against the Bible and, and listen very, very carefully to what's preached. Listen very carefully to what I'm preaching and listen very carefully to what other people preach, too. I mean, I like to listen to other sermons and stuff, too, but like really listen and tell me to every word and, and, and always be judging and thinking, is this found in the Bible? Because it's easy to make a statement and kind of lead you down a path of, of thinking. If that first statement's wrong, I mean, that just skews your direction and you can just keep going on and on. And, you can, and these guys, they'll continue to prove from the Bible what they're saying after they've already been diverted onto a wrong path. And then it makes it sound like it's right because they're using Bible, but they've already gone the wrong direction from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So just keep that in mind. Look out for some of these guys. And um, if you don't believe me on any of them, look it up for yourself. And then just look, 
listen to what they say and prove it against the Bible and come back to me if you think I'm wrong, but I'll, <laughs> I'm not wrong on this. But, but bring it back to me. I'd like to see it. I can show you where they're wrong. Anyway, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for, um, for this church, dear God. I thank you for everyone that's here today. Lord, help us to, to learn your Bible so that we wouldn't be simple ones. We wouldn't be deceived. God, we know there's a lot of people out there that are looking to make merchandise of us and, and that, are, that are just in it for the money and that they're covetous, dear God. And um, these false teachers and false prophets are, are just wicked, dear Lord. And I pray that you would please just help us to have the discernment and help us have the knowledge in order to spot them early on and not be deceived and just avoid them and mark them and, and have nothing to do with them, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.